So I'm Ryan Perkins. I'm the curator for South Asian Studies here at the library. And I'm very excited that we have three partition witnesses with us to speak today about their experiences in partition. And one, as we commemorate and we remember partition, um, is a time when the independence of India and Pakistan is celebrated, but it's also a time when we remember uh, the horrible things that, that happened during that time. And I hope that if we have a fence, we can, you know, these stories are important because it's part of who we are as humans and us retaining that past, which is so important. And part of the work of the library is we collect materials and working with the Partition Archive, we're collecting oral histories as well. So not just so that these, that we don't forget what has happened, so we don't repeat things, but also uh, if we lose these stories, also losing a part of who we are. And so I want to thank you all for making the time to come here this evening. Um, Gunita Singh Bhala, who is the one who started 1947 Partition Archive, is on her way. She got stuck in traffic in the East Bay. So we'll push her uh, little talk off until after she arrives. Um, but I'm very happy to have Jisha Menon, who is professor in theater and performance studies and is, in, is the director of global studies here, who will be moderating the, the Q&A and the conversation with um, our guests here today. So Major Ravi Chopra, who is seated over here, was born um, in 1941. It was very um, young when he experienced partition. Um, and then Balji Dhilan Vikram Singh, who is, who is seated right here in the middle, was born in 1940. And I'm gonna let Jisha, before we start that part, introduce him in more detail. Now, what I'm showing up here, so it was, I started here at Stanford in 2015, and before I came in this position, there was no one in the library at the university who was in the library working on South Asia. And so the university was really putting a lot of effort into expanding South Asia on campus in terms of offering more courses and hiring more faculty. And they knew that in order to do this, you needed to have a strong presence in the library to collect the materials that researchers and students are interested in working with. And so I came here in 2015 to try to build something from nothing. And shortly after that, Professor uh, Priya Satya, who's in the history department, and had worked with Gunita, knew Gunita for quite a while, had mentioned to me, what about working with the 1947 Partition Archive? They've made up of citizen historians who have collected and interviewed uh, partition witnesses. What do you think about working with them? So in a meeting with uh, the university librarian, the former vice provost, Mike Keller, and with Gunita and talked about kind of the bigger vision. And one of the bigger visions of that was they have now collected over 9,000 interviews of partition witnesses, which is no small feat. And so I think, you know, when Gunita's here, I think we, I really want to express our appreciation for the work that she and all the volunteers and the team have done. And so one of the things that we did is we created the Spotlight exhibit. Um, and I hope you can at least make it out enough and so if you go to exhibits.stanford.edu, you'll see a lot of different digital exhibits. And one of them is the 947 Partition Archive Survivors and Their Memories. And so we have put up about 51, 51 interviews here. And you'll see, um, this might be a familiar, familiar face here. <laughs> um, and so we have a number of interviews up here that you can go on and there's about 40, 43 of these are open access to anybody. There's some, for example, Fushwan Singh, whose family didn't want it totally open access yet. So his interview, it's only open to students or those with a, with a Stanford University ID right now. But for researchers who are interested in exploring any of these uh, or any of the other interviews, they're able to request from the Partition Archive to, to get access to these. And so um, when you do have time, so, for example, if we were to, if we click here, you'll see. So the family crossed the border, right? So, so when four adults in a jeep, you can't. And I'm like, we're not going to listen to each of the interviews right now, but I just want to give you a little taste so that when you have time, if this is an interest of yours of diving deeper, you know, of looking at more of the, the oral histories of uh, partition witnesses during this time. And then you'll see like a description of each, of each one. So that really the goal that we have is to try to put all, you know, about 9,500 interviews online for open access. Um, 
And so that is one of our, one of our future goals. So before I go any farther, I would like to, um, Jisha, if you wanna you know, speak a little bit and introduce our guests. And I think I had seen um, Mr. Ali Shah, who is here as well. So do you wanna come and, and, and sit up here, Mr. Mr. Ali Shah? And I'll let Jisha introduce the rest of the guests and we're we'll gonna have each of them kind of give a little bit of their story. And then Jisha is going to moderate a conversation. We'll open up to Q and A. And then whenever Gunita arrives, uh, she's going to talk a little bit about the work, how she got into this, and what they've been able to do in the in the future. So, Jisha, over to you. Hey, thanks so much, Ryan. This is uh, such an important event, and I'm so glad we're able to host this event. Uh, the work that Ryan has done and Gunita has done has really been tremendous and such an important part of collecting uh, you know, several narratives and stories that otherwise we would uh, not have with us. And I'm, I'm just a terrific fan of Gunita and Ryan, um, and it's a huge honor for me to participate in this event. So my interest in the partition actually emerged about 25 years ago when I was a student in Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi, and that was at the 50th um, anniversary of Indian independence. And I remember at that time uh, reading uh, all the sort of accounts that were being published in magazines and newspapers and kind of slowly getting a bit horrified because I was stunned how little I knew about the partition, even though I had grown up in India. So I grew up in Bangalore, which is you know, in the South, and I was surprised how little information about the partition I had and you know although I had friends whose families had migrated my own brother-in-law his family had moved from Rawalpindi so you heard the occasional story but I absolutely had no sense of the scale and dimensions of the partition so when I started reading these stories I remember India Today did a whole series on it and other magazines started to you know um, offer these stories I was I was uh, stunned by the scale and scope and magnitude of the, of the partition. And I remember around that time, because August 15th was of course a holiday, I had traveled with some friends to, um, you know, to Rajasthan because we, were, uh, we just wanted to enjoy that Independence Day. And we went to this small area called Barmer and then moved to uh, Choktan, which are really sort of remote desert villages. And we were stopped by security personnel who thought we were spies. So you can see that because, you know, that's like at the border, near the border of Pakistan. And so it was really kind of incredible that at the same moment that all of these stories are coming out, uh, there's also such a heightened security apparatus in, in, in place. So one of the things, you know, that occurred to me as I was processing all of this new information about uh, India's history, even though I had been a student of Indian history and had studied it in school, was, you know, what are the limits of this particular way of studying history? And that's something that I think the partition uh, archive really takes up very centrally, because uh, the way in which we're taught in, uh, history in Indian classrooms, we sort of focus on the big why questions, right? Why did the partition happen? Why did the British leave India? Who were the kind of major political figures who, uh, you know, who sort of made these big decisions? And we don't adequately think about the, the effects, right? We're sort of invested in the causal questions and we're not thinking what were the effects of the partition. And it was really at this moment that you have tremendous stories coming out that start detailing what the effects have been of the partition. And this is where, you know, as someone who works in the arts, I was a student of literature, I study, um, you know, um, theater and performance, I write about cinema, I write about arts. Uh, to me, these stories had a lot of breadth and depth. Uh, they offered much more textured, much more granular ways of approaching the partition than the kind of uh, high politics version of it where we got narratives from the you know sort of big political figures who were making these big decisions that impacted ordinary lives on the ground and it sort of spurred me to do more research and more thinking and of course short stories were another really central 
archive where we find a lot of uh, stories that pay attention to the effects of the partition. And so again, I want to emphasize that the partition archive has been absolutely central in capturing these sorts of stories, the granular, the small, the textured stories that otherwise we would miss in our attention to the high politics that are being played out by Jinnah, Gandhi, Mountbatten, and all the kind of major political figures. Um, and of course, you know, the numbers itself of the partition are kind of just astonishing, right? Between June 3rd, 1947, when the decision uh, was made to partition, uh, to divide India was announced, and August 15, 1947, the day of formal Indian independence, about 15 million people were displaced. Um, what the government euphemistically called exchange of populations meant that Muslims were traveling into Pakistan, Hindus and uh, Sikhs were traveling into India, and it was one of the largest human exoduses ever recorded. About two million people perished, 83,000 women were um, abducted, raped, killed, innumerable children disappeared. Uh, and I think Suhela is here who did a wonderful production of Pali last year that captured some of the just chaos and turbulence that happens when children get misplaced uh, in this kind of in these chaotic scenes uh, of migration across countries. And of course, people getting forcibly converted, and you can imagine who would be left behind, the elderly, the, the, the women, the disabled. So just, a, just these scenes of chaos unfolding um, at the same time that you have these big decisions being made, the territorial award announced August 16th, which is two days after the formation of Pakistan, one day after Indian independence, and people just sort of not knowing where they should be going, where is home, what is safe. Um, so it's, it's an event of such tremendous significance and these stories that we're collecting through the Partition Archive, they allow us to get much more nuanced and textured understandings of the upheaval that this created in so many people's lives. Um, and so, you know, again, it allows us to sort of move beyond very state versus humanist accounts or, you know, um, these sorts of binaries that we have in capturing a sense of the overall multidimensional um, event that it was. And of course, it's important also to remind ourselves that it wasn't just this one-off event. It's an event that had a continuing kind of repercussions. It's not an event that is just sort of uh, bounded and that it took place and it's over. It's effects have lingered on and transformed identities, subjects, relationships. Uh, so it's something that we continue to think about and grapple with even today. Um, so I, I want to introduce our speakers who will again, you know, give us a sense of the, the small stories that, we, that allow us to paint a much clearer picture. Um, Mr. Ali Shah, uh, Mr. Ali Shan was born January 5, 1941 in the Indian city of Ferozpur, state of Punjab. After a mob attacked his village, uh, a mobster rescued him and walked with him for days. He was then uh, raised by a Sikh family for six months and then taken by the Pakistan military to a camp in Lahore and reunited with his maternal uncle who raised him. Uh, Major Ravi Chopra was born in Lahore on October 26, 1938 in a small town, Kasowal, uh, from where he migrated to Delhi in mid-September 1947. He went on to work in the Indian Army and retired as Major General after 34 years. Since his retirement, he's been involved in theater activities and dancing groups in the Bay Area. And uh, Ms. Balji Dhillan, Vikram Singh, Mrs. Singh was born in 1940 in the village of Naniki near Lahore and fled with her family at the time of partition to Amritsar first before settling in Rajasthan. Mrs. Vikram Singh and her husband migrated to the US in 1969 where they raised four daughters and she runs a home renovation business and helps care for her many grandchildren. So warm welcome to you all and I think what we'll 
do is have you uh, speak about your own uh, experiences. So perhaps we'll start with you, sir. you are here. So first of all, I would like to thank Nita and her team because if it was not for her, my story would have never been told. I'm sorry, I may get a little emotional, so bear with me. Um, so um, so I want to tell you something about myself. It, uh, this tragedy with me, two tragedies with me in my early life. And also then I have few uh, few near death experience in here, the Bay Area. And that made me strong, resilient, and positive person. I respect all religion. I do not hesitate going to church, synagogue, temple, or any other place of worship. I respect all communities. I do not have any anger, hate, or grudge against anyone. My motto in life is love everyone, hate no one. About the village where I, it all happened, I uh, talk about that one now. The village is named Juraha in the uh, district of Ludhiana. And uh, when the partition came and we had this uh, problem there, I, we were, my, it was our uh, generation for my father's side, the family. They were living there for generations. When my father was born there, we weren't even born there. I got, we got there, me, my older brother and my mother, we got there through another tragedy two years before. We were born in Frozpur, me, my older brother, and three sisters. And uh, my father was a detective in British police. So one night there was a robbery attempt at our house. Two men uh, jump over the wall and uh, my father woke up and they wanted to go inside the house. He was sleeping in the patio. He didn't let him, them go because he was concerned for our safety. He said he didn't want them to go inside the house. So they killed him there. In all that commotion, we opened the door and came out and uh, started uh, crying to all of us. And by the time we got to him, he, he, he died already. So police came, they took some notes and they went. And the, uh, when we came out, the door two person uh, ran away, climbed over and vanished. Then um, my maternal uncle, he sent a message to my uh, uh, uncle in Ludhiana, my father's older brother, to come over and get them. So he rented a truck, so drove to Frozpur and uh, uh, put up all, every, our household things and then got us in there and drove back to the town. When he got to his house, he called his 
two brothers who were farming over land in Duraha so to decide what to do with us. So when we got there, against my mother's wishes, they separated the family. Because there were no girls school in, uh, in our uh, village, so they said that the best way to my three sisters stay behind with my uncle, and me, my brother, and my mother get there uh, in the village. So we went with them to the village and uh, they give us a house and they took care of us. So this life became somewhat not. But uh, two year pause and partial came. So one uh, elder of the house was debating what to do, move out or stay here. Uh, they didn't, couldn't decide where you live there for generations. So it's very hard to make a decision to uproot yourself and go somewhere else, strange place. So um, uh, they were just debating all of a sudden. One early morning, we heard the noise outside the uh, village, and my mother went up, uh, upstairs on a flat roof. And we followed her, and we saw in the early morning, sun, sword drawn, spears shining in there. So my, I don't know what was going through my mother's mind, but she was standing there, don't, don't know what to do. So in the meantime, my uncle came and shouted us to come downstairs. So we came down, he said, follow him. So we follow him, there was a hall, meeting hall in the middle of the village. So they, he took us there, and when we got there, there were nearly about, over 100 women and children already in the hall. So they said, uh, he said that from everybody inside, lock the door, and uh, don't open the door for anybody. So, uh, People in small children were crying. There was no water, it was so much hot. So, but after about half an hour or so, we had heard the knock on the door. They said open the door and nobody would open the door. So two people who were attacking, they went up, up to the roof and hope, made a hole there and put a gun in there and said, well, if you guys don't open the door, We'll put a set fire into the uh, in the hall in the hall and you will die burn down alive anyway. So somebody in the in the hall said, Okay, we're going to die anyway, so just open the door. So when open the open the door, someone opened the door and there was one gunman standing there. He would let women and girls go, but not boys. He was killing everyone male over there, small child or whoever was there. So um, my mother saw that. She find one white sheet there, she tore it up and wrapped around us like a girl. So we passed through. And they took everybody into the one tree underneath, they was guiding us to sit there. When they got everybody there, first of all, they said that all the women give the jewelry to them. So whoever, uh, jewelry, whatever, then they try to take it off, especially the earring, it won't come off, then they snatch the jewelry from their ears. After that, they start killing. And I was standing there in the middle. Traumatized. And, uh, looking around and see people uh, uh, injured, crying for help, some being killed. And uh, all of a sudden one uh, person with a sword, my two aunties were sitting beside me and uh, with the sword, they killed, killed them both. And blood splashed on to my clothes. And I shoot up. But I still stood there. 
I don't know what God had in mind for me, that I was standing, nobody tried to kill me. And then my brother tried to escape. He didn't go very far. One person with a spear hit him and he fell down. And they start, he started killing him, him. And all of a sudden my mother went after him, fell over him to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, for, uh, for him to cover cover him and uh, they were both killed there then i uh, all of a sudden i was so traumatized i don't know what was going on so i stood there for i don't know how long all of a sudden like a lightning fear went through my body and uh, I start running to one direction and one uh, person with the spirit came to kill me and uh, before he get to me I bump into the other person who was killing as well and he had my hand and the other uh, person tried to kill me he said don't kill this boy he wants me to take take with him so he, he, the other person didn't do, uh, didn't kick, um, try to kill me then. So then he dropped his uh, arms, took me away from there, and we, uh, he had my hand. We start walking. We walked two days and almost two nights. Along the way, he was so pro protective. He will hide me in the sugar canes and go into the village and uh, get some food to eat. So he will come back and I was sitting in the uh, sugar can feed. I was uh, scared for the wild animal or snake and I was shaking all the time. But thank God I was okay. So then he will come, we'll eat something and slept, sleep a little bit, then start walking again. After two days, you know, night, we go into one village. It was not very far from Ludhiana. And he knocked one door, and the lady of the house came. He said, here's the boy you wanted. So he left me there. I'd never seen him again. And the, the family uh, really treated me well. And after two days, two days they took me to the Gurdwara, converted me into Sikh religion, and uh, gave me a different name. So I just kept going whatever they wanted me to do. So I lived there six months, and I wanted to go to their fields for work. The boys were working there too. So time went on. And then the, they didn't tell anybody in the village that who I was. They just uh, tell them that one, I'm one of their relatives' uh, son to come to help them. But their older boy had some friend. He told him that who I was. So somehow they had argument, and that boy, uh, boy his friend, went to the. Uh, uh, Ludhiana and told military that I was there. What happened was this, in, when India and Pakistan came in Japan, there was agreement between India and Pakistan that their delegation of military delegation go there and recover people from both sides of the border and when the bus load is there, they will load them up and uh, take them to the prospective countries. So, and funny, uh, is, uh, one, my, one of the military uh, 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 person was my uh, 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 father's uncle. So when he heard my, my name, he went straight away to recover me. And they were not supposed to march in the house. Uh, uh, they would knock the door if the person, uh, uh, the person they're looking for is there, they will find otherwise they go back. So 
Then one, and they ask, uh, go to that boy, boy who told them, he said, what to do? We are gonna find him. He said, you have to come at night when everybody's home. So they came at night, knocked the door, and then said, where is the Muslim boy? I was sleeping upstairs. So they, came, they called me down and I came down and uh, said, we have come to take you. I was so scared, I started crying. I didn't want to go because I don't know who they were. So then my uh, cousin uncle told, uh, took me on side. He told me stories that he used to come see us in the village and all that. So and he told my uh, family's names. So then I was a bit uh, comfortable. So I went with them. So they took me to Ludhiana. There I was in a had shaved with my hair grown and all that. So he took the barber and uh, got me uh, new clothes and all that. So he kept me two weeks and then he sent me uh, in the bus to Pakistan. So in Pakistan, on, in Lahore, there was a, a, a camp there. So uh, he, uh, over there, everybody will go into the camp. But before they go into the camp, they were given a, a, a number and father's name for registration. So when we got, got in the camp, there I was looking for my family. I couldn't find them in there. So uh, people used to come every day to look for their relatives. So they would call the name of the number of the person they were looking for, father's name or mother's name. So they will make a note of the number and then after the announcement, they will go inside the office and say, this is the person we were looking for. So my uncle went in and uh, found me and took me to his home in Kasu. That's about border town, 30 miles away from the hall. When we got in his house, he just left me there and that was it. I needed counseling badly. or some hugs and love. But of course, they didn't know about it. So I have to live in trauma for six more years. I, I will go to school. I won't believe the children. I will stay behind class and read books. And same home, when I come home, I will do the same. And at night I used to cry, miss my family. Then, uh, after six years, I used to go prepare in the mosque. Of course, I was sad looking for a boy. So there, one person, he noticed me. That I, why I'm so sad, being so young. So he, one day, he took me aside. He said, uh, who are you? What's your father's name? So I told him, I said, I don't know. this is name, but my father was killed in Atampar Shiv. So he said, don't worry, my father died when I was young. So it's okay. So he told me, he, did, he used to get with friends every evening, uh, with the, uh, in the get together. So he says, come over there. So I went there uh, where he told me to. So all these friends were there, they were joking and smiling, laughing, and I still was quiet. So one day he said, uh, stay behind and I want to talk to you. So uh, when the son's gone, he said, look, he said, I know what you're going through, but you have to do two things. He said, you have to forget the past and you have to forgive those people. Who killed your family? I was looking for some way out, so I accepted it. I was a different person. Then I, I was going to high school. I finished my high school in uh, high, uh, first division in high numbers. And uh, when I came home, I told my uh, uh, uncle that I passed in high numbers. Now that they just listened, that that's the end of the story. I was uh, crying. I said, if my parents were there, there would have been different 
thing. But uh, then this my friend came and he saw me, knocked the door, I came down and he saw me, some, uh, uh, was to cry. So he took me with him, he took me with two other friend and they took me for dinner. So then brought me back. So he came, became my mentor. And all my life, he got, he got me through. When I passed, the, uh, uh, um, done the metric, he said, what, after, he waited for two weeks for me to say something. I, uh, I just, uh, then he asked me, you know what you're doing now? I said, I'll get a job. He said, no, you can't. He said, the job will you get is a clerical job. How can you afford your family with a clerical job? You got to go to college. I said, I don't know where the college is. But in the meantime, when my father died, he had 25,000 rupees in the bank. They were transferred to Pakistan, so I had enough money. He said, you have enough money, so you just go to the college. I said, I don't know how to do it, so he will take me. So we'll go every day, go with me to uh, interview different colleges, government college, and uh, 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 college for arts, and other colleges, and then uh, FC college as well. So I gave the interview in government college and FC college, and I was accepted in FC college. There, uh, it was missionary college. So uh, I, uh, I bought a bike and used to bike to the college. So I finished my graduation. Then uh, in the meantime, my sister and her husband were in London already, in England. So they asked me to come over. So I said, okay, so 1961, I left Pakistan. But I was adventurous, so me and my few friends, we went over to Karachi. From there, we boarded a, a ship, went to Basra from Baghdad, and then by train to Lebanon. From Lebanon, we went over to London. And uh, London, from, by train, because my sister and my uh, uh, mother-in-law, they were in Glasgow. So we went to Glasgow, I lived there for seven years. Then they moved into London, so I moved, moved with them. But London I didn't like much, so from there we moved into Southampton. That's where, Port City, that's where I stayed for 15 to 16 years. In 1967 I got married, I drove from London to Lahore and got married and came back to Pakistan as well. It was 7,000 each way. Oh, wow. But it was a very nice adventure. <laughs> <laughs> For me it was, although my wife didn't like it. <laughs> but uh, then from there, one day, we, one time we came to, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Can I have a little bit more, please? <laughs> I should have gone into that detail. <laughs> but anyway, so uh, from London, we came here for a visit, and then we liked the place, so we moved here in the Bay Area. So since then, I'm here, and uh, everything is fine. <laughs> so thank you for listening. Thank you so much. So, um, I, I say uh, the one uh, Shakespeare's title, All is Well if Ends Well. <laughs> so that's where it happened to me. So thank you for listening. Thank you. Major, I retired as a general. Of the it's called Major General, but actually, when we address, we say General Chopra. And secondly, uh, just pardon my Indian accent, those, uh, because that's how we are 
uh, grown up with this kind of accent, I hope you can follow what I'm saying. Uh, before I uh, come to my experiences of partition, I should like to give you a little background. You see, when Britishers decided to leave, their policy divide and rule, I think that's, that's what they held very close to their heart. And they called a gentleman from Brit uh, England, his name was Redcliffe. He was invited to come to India and draw the partition. Now this gentleman had never visited India before. He was a uh, just a uh, cartographer with map maker. And uh, when he came to India, he was given only five weeks to draw a line between India and Pakistan. And so therefore he he I don't he didn't know where to start from. So he got hold of the 1941 census of India. And based on those census, we noted which are the majority Muslim area, which is the majority Hindu area. And accordingly, he drew a line on the map and presented to the umpire. So this was a kind of a haphazard partition, not based on some realities on the ground. So he tried as many Muslims in Pakistan and as many Hindus in India. But with the result that there are many, many Hindu Muslims left on the wrong side of the line, millions of them. And that's when the started exodus. That is when the situation went out of hand, out of control. Because the Lord Mount Patton announced the partition. And then there were internal disturbances, looting, rioting, and even killing. So when the migration started, there was killing from both sides. The trains going to Pakistan for massacred, people were massacred. Coming from Pakistan to India, people were massacred. I was uh, born in Lahore in October and I will be 84 years of after two days and uh, I have very vivid mem memories of my partition days. I was in a, a town, small town called Kasoval. And from there, my father was in the police station. He went to Lalpur on promotion and left us at the mercy of uh, one businessman, Tikam Jant. Now, around mid September, partition was 15th August, uh, 47, but mid, mid September things are going okay. But then suddenly, the horrors of partition started to take shape. Our um, uh, second in command of the police station, he came and informed us, you better leave tonight, otherwise your house is going to be burnt and you may be probably all killed. There's a planning going on, and this is what's going to happen tomorrow. So in a hurry, whatever we could gather, my grandmother, myself, and my younger brother, under the care of this businessman, Tikam Chan, we left at night, went to the station, and <clears throat> caught the mail train. Not the passenger, passenger, we were worried about passenger because they will stop at every station, so we wouldn't want to run the risk at every stoppage. So luckily we got a mail train and 
what we saw in route was horrifying. The houses were being burnt. I saw women jumping into the well, people running after the woman. And it was humanity at its worst. We had to change the train at Raivind to go to India, Firozpur. And that is where again the firing started at the Raivind station. I got a bullet on my cough. Luckily, Mark is almost gone now. A little bit is still there. And my grandmother didn't know how to attend to it. So she tore off her dhoti, made a bandage of this, and sterilized it with her urine, and put the bandage on my wound. So in that kind of condition, we had to get into the train. Luckily, the assistant station master of Raven Station was a Muslim gentleman, and our businessman Tikam Chand paid, paid him jewelry, paid him cash because he was to travel to Kasur, border town in Trospur, uh, Pakistan, and India's border town. And he was to, since he was a station master, he was he was having a first class compartment. So. We paid a handsome, handsome money, and with his help, we got accommodation in the first class compartment. Otherwise, people were on the roof of the train, on the couplings of the train, and I was told some were in front of the engine also. Wherever they could find a place, they boarded that train. But we were fortunate enough that with the help of this gentleman, we got a comfortable place in a first class compartment. But then we didn't know whether we would be able to reach our destination in one piece. When the train started, we, we, we could see on the railway track, the bodies lying on the railway tracks killed people. And uh, watching that to this tender age of eight and a half years, you can imagine my psyche. As to what is happening, uh, I, I developed fever. My brother developed, his younger brother developed fever. I was wounded. So it was a precarious condition that we were traveling. But only good part was that we were traveling comfortably in a first class compartment. And then, when the train would stop at a station, the Muslim would come. Uh, they will ask for any, any, I remember these words they used to say, any sick the bacha. They were again because they were deadly against uh, uh, Sikh uh, community because from when the train coming from India to Pakistan, a lot of killing was done. It, that was a rumor spread. And then they will ask, so this station master used to tell him, look, my family is traveling. There's nobody because we used to hide in the bathroom under the under the uh, seat so that we are not visible to those people who are coming to kill you. And that is how after two three stoppages, at every stoppage they will come and this station master will open the window, tell them, look, here's my family, here's my son, here's my daughter, and there's nobody else here. So uh, so they will just peep around and we will hide ourselves and that is how we reached the border town of Kasur. Now here we didn't want st uh, station master, I, I don't remember his name but I remember the big beard and he was like an angel to us and then we requested him that you move, leave the compartment only when the train moves because we never know what happens in between. So he obliged. He got off the moving train. Of course, his family was um, uh, already on the platform. And moving train, he got off. And then he waved us as I still remember, wear white beard, waving hand, 
Nathan Angel saying, okay, bye bye, take care. And that is how we reached Ferozpur in one piece. And <clears throat> that is where we were offered our fruits, milk. That's the first meals we had after about two, three days starting. And then when we came out of the uh, train, believe you me, there was total massacre of the other compartments. There were headless bodies, hands, legs hanging on the compartment, blood splattered on the uh, compartment. And uh, it is only thanks to this angel of ours that we reached uh, alive. Otherwise, the whole train was uh, slaughtered and everybody was killed. So that is the small story of partition. And here's Gunita, you can see Gunita coming. She was watching my play. This Lahorni they church Jamiani. And after that I had narrated the partition story subject on the same similar lines. And that is where I think she came to my house in 2010, I think. 2010, 2010 when she recorded, maybe the first one, or the, among the first one, she recorded my story. And that is how the archive of partition started. And today, what a wonderful job she has done, what, how much hard work she has put, that today almost about 10,000 stories have been recorded, not only of the Indian people, but she went to Pakistan, I think Bangladesh, everywhere, all over the world, and she recorded these stories. And that stories are now an archive <coughs> the, telling the um, um, woes of the victims who went through this partition line. And uh, this is uh, all I have to say. If you have any questions later, you can ask me later. If you want to have any questions now, you can ask me now. Namaskar, Satsrikar, Jai Hind, Salaam Alaikum. I pen these words in honor of my grandfather, Sardar Natha Singh, my father, Sardar Sajid Singh, and my mother, Bibi Pritam Kaur, who showed so much strength, fortitude, and courage. Long ago and far away, a little girl was born with a silver spoon in her mouth into a grand old family. Life was idyllic, imported black Labrador puppies to play with, white carrier pigeons to fly, horse buggies to ride in, mango groves to swing in, canals and tributaries to swim in. Her ancestors, the lions of Punjab, members of the Gillan and Khera clans were warriors and farmers and landlords in the land of the five mighty rivers. This perfect dream abruptly ended when she was awakened in the middle of the night. Why am I being awakened up? Don't ask, said Sultano, the midwife who had helped bring her into this world about six years ago. She was dressed, made ready. There was a hush-hush and a state of urgency. She saw her mother pull out bricks from the wall from behind her bed in the large, cool, dark room. Take everything valuable, 
from the Godridge Almada, the Amwar, the money, the jewelry, the gold, the coins, put them in the vault, wall, vault, her mother said to Sultana. The little girl did not know there was such a hiding place behind her bed. The little girl was carried down the stairs to the waiting jeep where her father stood tall and strong. He signaled, we must leave now while it's dark, before the sun rises, so we are not stopped and detained on the way. Sultano caressed the little girl's head. You will be back in a few days, she said. Her voice was so full of love and care that the little girl couldn't help but believe her. Little did she know that she was never going to return to her childhood home again. Memories of that house and home, land and sultano left behind would live in the deep crevices of her mind. She did not understand she was about to become a refugee, that the life of lush mango groves near Lahore would turn into harsh sandstones of Rajasthan and horse buggies would be traded for camel carts. The little girl, her mother, Biji, aunt, Chachiji, uncle, Chachiji, and two younger brothers, Harmeet and Ranjit, crowded into the jeep. Her father, Papaji, started the fateful changing journey not knowing they were leaving Nayeki village forever. They did not look back. Papaji and Chachaji, armed with pistols and rifles, discussed the route they must take. Go along the canal. There, will, there we will not be observed. We know every village along that road. The main road will be watched. Biji and Chachiji prayed silently. As the day dawned, the little, girl, the little girl's brother slept, but she could not. She looked at the fields, the changing shadows and light, the wide canal with its rippling life-giving waters. Strange objects were bobbing in the gushing water. She realized these were bloated human bodies. Some headless, some without limbs, arms, hands, feet, some naked, some clothed, earthly possessions, animals, beds, trunks. The canal was carrying this carnage. The little girl was riveted and aghast with what she was watching and witnessing. Don't look, Biji put her hands over the little girl's eyes. As the journey continued, more horror, overturned buses, tractors, cars, more dead bodies, young and old, women and children. It seemed endless. The jeep came to a sudden halt. Right in front, out of nowhere, a row of white uniformed men stood pointing rifles at them. The servant ran away and hid in the sugarcane field. Papaji and Chachaji started to draw their pistols. Biji pushed their hands down. No, they will kill us all. She jumped out of the jeep, raised her hands high and ran <coughs> towards the armored men. She laid her head and her dupatta, her headscarf, her honor at the captain's feet. Have mercy, have mercy. I have small children. Let us go. We have done no harm to anybody. The leader signaled the men to put the rifles down. He lifted Biji up, looked, her, looked at her and asked, are you related to Sadar Bahadur Taran Singh of Usman? You resemble him. She answered, yes, yes, I am his daughter. He told 
the little girl's mother, that he had been shown mercy many years ago by her father, a magistrate, and had never forgotten him. He approached Papaji and told him to drive on, but not to stop in the next village, because they had orders to burn it that night. Papaji thanked him, drove on, and stopped in Jaloki to warn the village of the impending danger before continuing the journey. Once more, the little girl was awake, awakened in the middle of the night. It was summertime and hot. The high flames of Jaloki burning were easily seen from the rooftop terrace of the next village where they, were slept, where they slept. The heat, the smoke, the screams filled the air. Once more, they fled in a hurry. Papaji did not follow the canal road, but went through the village back roads, crossing the fields and the small waterways. The journey was rough and bumpy and slow. The elders seemed very quiet. Finally, at dusk, the little girl arrived in the village of Usma, her mother's birthplace. She felt safe, but conflicted. The journey had left her with images of horror, and the elders being silent, she had no way of understanding the magnitude of what she had just lived through and the suffering that was still to come. She would live years in abject poverty, sharing her food and life with desert farm animals, not knowing when things would change for the better. Now the little girl is 80 years old, a mother of four girls, a grandmother of 10, and a great grandmother of another little girl, Sophia, who is making music back then. <laughs> she passes on virtues and values inherited and learned from her ancestors to her descendants. Duty, hard work, humility, kindness, empathy, generosity, lifting people up, and gratitude for the gifts of life. She reflects, and the questions remain, why was the motherland partitioned? Why did millions get displaced, and millions lose their lives? Why was she among the lucky ones? Why her? The images will never fade, the trauma will never leave, and the fear of drowning will never let her put her head under water. She will always honor her ancestors who sacrificed so much, bring normalcy to her and her brother's lives. And she will always remember that a single act of mercy and generosity can save a family. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, these are all incredibly powerful accounts of what uh, you have experienced. And it's really extraordinary to me to uh, just listen to you and just hear the vividness and precision of your memories. It's really striking that you have so many details that you haven't forgotten. And one of the things that we, we read about when you have extreme trauma in your life is that you return to that event repeatedly over and over again because you're trying to make some sense of what happened, what transpired. And so it takes you again and again to that scene of trauma repeatedly to try and see how, how did this happen? What did I miss? How could I have not experienced this? How could I have foreseen it or prevented it? And that kind of traumatic repetition, it almost kind of makes that memory just grind into your bones. And what I'm really struck by is just the precision. As you mentioned, the, the way in which memory sits in your crevice, you know, it's sort of just grinded into your body in a certain way. And I, you know, one of the things I'd invite you to reflect on now, it's 75 years since this has happened. So despite the passage of time, 
his memories are still so incredibly vivid. And also the distance, right? What you're in, these scenes of home that you're imagining, you, you know, you were relocated, you moved to other homes. So maybe if you could reflect on, um, reflect on what the 75th uh, year since the partition means to you now that you're here in the US, in California, where we encounter people from different uh, ethnicities and communities and you know there's a different inflection of home because that is home this is home you you moved to multiple homes so I'd invite you to reflect on what the 75th um, anniversary means to you the 75th anniversary reminds me Remind me always what I went through. So it never goes. As soon as uh, the day, uh, what happened on that day, it comes to me and I was kind of really get emotional. And uh, then my children will make sure they get to my house and have a get together so that I'll try to forget the past but still it never goes it's still there it will be there all the time any time nursery anniversary comes it will be the same yeah, it's, it's very hard Why did it happen? Why did it have to happen? Uh, because I always heard my parents say that the Muslims, and we are brothers, we share the same food, we share the same habits, we share the same land. How have we suddenly become enemies? Um, I've always been a pacifist, but it's very hard to kind of wonder why the powers of the world have still not learned their lessons. Um, we, we've lost a lot of family members. We, my brothers fought two or three wars. Uh, one brother was totally damaged psychologically and I had literally had to take care of him in the US for the last 18 years of his life. So the tragedy just doesn't happen in one generation. I think it really affects many generations. I think that's a really important point. We talk about trauma being multi-generational, and it's not something that just happens and it's over, but yes. it lingers and it's carried on through multiple generations. General Chopra, would you like to reflect on what this day means, 75th anniversary? What are my thoughts? My first thought is that um, could we have avoided this partition? As she said, we are living amicably, Hindus, Muslims, socializing with each other, and and then this horrifying partition thrown on us. Could it, could it have been avoided? I think so. Had it not been the uh, ambition of the leadership of that time, there was no need for partition. Why have it? It's just to satisfy the ambitions of few, few uh, people, the leadership of that time. I mean, uh, we, we could have carried on, even the British had left, then we could have carried on the way we were. The same uh, uh, Bhaichara or, or the friendship or the brotherhood and uh, looking after each other, socializing with each other. That could have been avoided um, if the leadership of that time acted judiciously. 
The second thought which comes to my mind is that even if, let's say, the partition was thought to be inevitable, but then you could have, couldn't have been, uh, you, you should have waited and done some law and order uh, measures, taken some law and order measures to make sure that it doesn't take an ugly situation. You could have first deployed the police, paramilitary forces, even army and the sensitive areas to make sure that no untoward incident happens. And then and the law and order situation was under the control. Then perhaps you could have declared independence. But as I said in my talk, it was suddenly, without much notice thrust upon us, and within weeks, the partition lines were drawn by Radcliffe, and we were thrown to our fate. So these are my thoughts. Firstly, it could have been avoided, and secondly, if it had to happen, the leadership of that time should have ensured that law and order is not jeopardized. My grandfather lost his parents when they were moving from uh, Pakistan to India on 14th of August. Uh, I might want to sit down. <laughs> uh, the trauma has passed on family over, over several generations, and uh, it was several years later after you know we were watching the film Gadar that uh, I actually came to know in my life that you know such a thing had, had even happened in my family. But I don't want to revisit the trauma. There's something that I was not able to learn from my grandparents, and that was, how was your life back there? What kind of foods did you eat? What kind of music did you listen to? What clothes did you wear? What, how did you have fun? Those are things that uh, I was never able to uh, relive or even imagine. And just last year, actually, my grandfather passed away. So I'd love to hear from, from you if you can you know, elaborate on that. Yeah, you see, as I said, that we were living amicably. I mean, see, I, if I'm living today, I owe my life to two Pakistani gentlemen. One was the uh, uh, Muharram of, of the police station who warned us well in time to leave. And second was that assistant station master who saved us all through the journey. So I owe my life to, to this Muslim. And, and, and before the partition was announced, we were eating the same food. In fact, I remember that Muharram's wife used to cook for us and, and feed us like a mother feeds her child. He was a Muslim. But there was no, there was no love lost. There was absolutely um, so, so much of, uh, fraternity, love and affection. Uh, even your social behavior, um, people used to move about. I used to go to school, and Modi used to teach me Urdu, which I still remember how to read and write. And so, so that that kind of atmosphere was there, and uh, your grandparents, I'm, I'm sure, they must have lived the same life there. three out of four of my grandparents who lived in Pakistan pre-partition. Um, my mother's side, perhaps. Yeah, my mother's side, a more privileged life in Pakistan, and my father's side, my grandfather was a very poor village boy who used to walk, I think, five to 10 km to, to receive schooling every day. Um, what I hear from my mother's side is a lot of grief around partition, and what I hear from my father's father, what I used to hear from him, is that he would have died a poor village boy in Pakistan, if not for the partition. And that sort of leveling story was really hard to reconcile with the kind of grief, trauma, anger response that we carry, um, because the reality is I wouldn't exist, and my grandfather never would have received an education if not for that incredible leveling. I'm just curious about you know, what we would say about that 
that type of opportunity that many people did not get um, until the partition uprooted their lives and what kind of lessons we could take, not just from a purely negative perspective around what it did to people. Can you make the question a little louder than I'd like it to also? Yeah, sure. It's essentially, <laughs> essentially that partition changed people's lives also for the better. It created educational opportunities for people who otherwise never would have been educated because they moved from a poor village to a city. Um, it, there, were, there were positive outcomes, which is very difficult to contend with. I'm curious what you all do. So her, most yes. of her family had the negative trauma. Yes. Her paternal grandfather, because he was a poor village boy, because of partition, was able to have new and amazing opportunities. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the positive stories out of this horror? I think similar stories are also true for gender, right? I mean, as you're talking about class opportunities, even for gender, I believe it, it did open up a lot of opportunities for women, etc. So I don't know if you had a gendered perspective or, or anything like that. But we also, I mean, we can take more questions that you don't, you know, are there other questions that go? There's a couple of, did you want to you, yeah, you know the positive I would say is um, the positive um, I would say is what I learned from my um, what happened to my parents and grandfather and all to all of us today would be an atrocious thing. But what I learned looking at their lives that they took took it in their stride. They made every single sacrifice so that we could have a better life, sending us to school, taking care of us, never complaining. Um, I remember a story where my, my mother did parda. That means she didn't show her face to my grandfather. And he came over and he asked her for water. And in Rajasthan, the water was we drank from the same pond that the animals drank, except it was going through and purified with uh, uh, through the water, through cloth, and then another chemical, uh, natural thing that they don't. She handed him the glass of water, and he started crying. And he said, oh, Bibi, you came from such a noble family. Look what my family has done to your hands. Because they were very hard worked, and they were brown, um, she said, don't cry for my hands. Look how lucky we are and we are all together. So to me, that has always been a positive thing. If you look at my hands, they're probably like my mother's. Since I came to America, I started my life with 50 cents an hour babysitting. So to me, that wasn't hardship. I love children. And I had four of my own and I did not want to leave them alone. I had to raise them until they went to school. They all became good mothers, maybe because I was babysitting. <laughs> so one of the things that I'm noticing here is that a lot of people in the audience have their own stories, and I'm really curious to hear your voices as well. So maybe what we'll do is just collect a few questions or comments and then have our speakers respond, because we'd love to hear from you, because these are also really contributing to offering a much more complex mosaic of uh, narratives. So why don't you start and then we can, if others have questions or comments, just raise your hands. Uh, first, not to go down a rat hole, but uh, there are gender opportunities for women in Pakistan and uh, a woman has been a president twice, uh, prime minister and uh, continued as this. Uh, so this is not quite fair to say that, you know, when we'll be the border would be the opportunities if you're a woman. But, that was not <laughs> intention either way. It's about moving from a rural village to a city. I see. Okay, okay. Maybe I misunderstood the context. Yeah. Thank you so much. So you know, um, so I, I am a product of um, a parent, you know, grandparents. Some grandparents who decided to stay in India. They said Hindustan is my. Uh, my land. Uh, I'm not going to leave Hindustan. Um, yeah, I come from a Muslim family from Hyderabad, Dakkan. 
uh, and then other parts of my father, my father uh, then said, well, you know, there's better opportunities for us in Pakistan. Um, my, my uncles have defended India <laughs> in the armed forces and they continue to do so. Um, um, so, um, you know, I'm really distressed with the polarized situation in India when you have uh, lynchings due to eating, you know, suspected of eating beef and so forth, uh, among other things. What would you say to your countrymen, you know, in India, you know, I mean, you have a love for the land that you were born in. <laughs> yeah. So what would you say to them? How do you say, look, uh, <laughs> would you like to answer something? Mm -hmm. okay. I wrote something down. We do not and cannot choose which religion we will be born in. So who gives anyone the right to war, plunder, kill with impunity on the basis of religion, color, or creed? So I would say to my countrymen in India, why this polarization? Because did you have a choice to be Muslim? Did I have a choice to be a Sikh? Did we pick our parents? The land we are born is And if there are other folks who have questions or comments, please. It's uh, 75 years since the uh, the tragedy of the Bakshin. And uh, I keep reflecting how much have you learned from the history, how much history keeps repeating itself. Does you're not able to hear me? She can't. She just went off the mask. I'll, I'll, I'll explain it to my mom. No, it's okay. Um, I can ask a question without fear of going. <laughs> uh, so it's 75 years since the tragedy of partition, and uh, I keep reflecting about how history, sometimes we have not learned from the history and it keeps repeating itself over and over again. Uh, Major General G, you said about uh, leadership uh, around the time and what the ambitions of what they did, uh, personal ambitions of the leadership of that time and what trauma it caused to the whole millions of people. We have a new generation of leadership today. If you care to comment about the leadership that is there in either of the countries, I'd love to hear it because I've, I don't know what to say about uh, what's happening. You see, I've been in the army and you see we are um, uh, not to get involved in the politics. Because uh, our trends suggest so that keep away from politics. Whosoever is the government of the day, you have to follow their policies and their orders. So yes, it, 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 it depends upon the leadership um, of, uh, of the day to uh, ensure uh, how much uh, developments take place in their respective places. So I don't want to compare, but as we see today in India, uh, seeing the positive side of how we have developed, we have DRDO, we have DRDL, research lab, lab labs, uh, we have at atomic Baba, uh, uh, atomic energy, we have ISRO, producing missiles, satellites, and lately, only as in last week, we went to the uh, telecom of uh, 5G, and uh, which is a, I mean, these are the kind of uh, uh, developments uh, which the leadership of the day brings it. And these achievements have not happened in a day. It has taken the toil of many generations, 75 years today, and, but we have, we have not been sitting on our haunches. We have been developing, we have been looking forward, 
And, and today, um, I think we are the uh, third largest economy in the world, in India. So, so these are uh, the uh, how the leaders lead you to, to such kind of uh, progress. Um, and as far as the army is, con army is concerned, uh, we have uh, no questions asked, but we do our time. And um, if we are asked to uh, uh, take up a challenge given by the government, we accept it and fulfill those challenges to the best of our ability. So we have time for just a couple more questions. I believe there are a couple questions at the back. So we'll take those two and then we'll invite Gunta Palla, who's here, to say a few words about the partition. Awesome. Thank you so much, by the way, for just sharing your story and being so open with us. Um, all four of my grandparents are from the Pakistani side of Punjab originally, and I'm just struck by how universal what you're saying is with what I've heard from them and what I've heard from so many other people in this generation. Um, but I'm really curious to learn, it seems like the partition was a Hindu and a Muslim majority focused occurrence, how do you think that affected other minority groups within the region, like the six other communities, you know, especially like the land of Punjab, which was split in half, what, what's been the long-term impact? And we can take the other question as well. They all say Muslim Hindu, but what about the minorities, like the other what the effect was? Hi, I have more of a comment. Um, all four of my grandparents were born in Hyderabad, Dakhan, and they were fortunately spared the trauma, the direct trauma of partition, but my mother's family ended up moving to Pakistan after the fall of Hyderabad, which is another traumatic event. So, and my father's family remained in Hyderabad. So I'm half, half, I'm half Pakistani, half Indian. And my lifelong deepest dream is for, it makes me emotional, but I wish for, I wish we could undo. And of course I know geographically it can't happen or politically, but it can happen through understanding, mutual understanding. Also, I think we should focus on the minorities of each country. And I've taken a lot of interest in the stories of the Hindus in Pakistan. And I also know, I've been to both countries, and I also know the plight of some people, some Muslims in India as well. But you know, it's the same story that's being told just with different names. So just wanted to tell you guys that. Maybe one last question. Oh, let's take that. Thank you so much for sharing. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll keep it short. I, I don't think it's a question, I think it's more of a comment. That so far we talked about what created the differences between the two places. And a lot of the stories are common, right? I mean, you talk about one train bringing those, you know, dead bodies and, and people with such deep, profound trauma across from one border to another. And so I think there's a commonality of suffering that was endured by both group of people. We talked about so much of that over, over, over a period of time. I think we live in an age which, which binds us together through social media, there's a lot of interaction. So what do you think, uh, General Saab, Khastar we could um, bridge that differences now and try to forge a new relationship ahead, regardless of who is in the government, because people come and go, but uh, the human contact that could be reestablished. Do you have anything to say about that? How can we do it? Obviously, so on. So I think the last question will be with the Thank you uh, everyone so much for sharing uh, your stories. My name is Ogir Salwani. My parents, my grandparents were from uh, Sindh, which is in southern Pakistan. Um, two months ago, I was able to visit my grandparents' homes. Their, uh, their homes in Sindh, their, their pre-partition homes. Um, and it challenged some of the preconceptions that I didn't even know I had. Um, and it was just a wonderful experience. And my grandparents are all gone, but I was wondering, like, would they want to make that journey with me? Um, so my question to you is, would you, have you been back to your childhood home? Would you want to go back? Would you want your children and grandchildren to go back as well? Thank you. 
So, I mean, it doesn't have to be a specific question, just your thoughts. What we're hearing from you know, our audience is that so many of them have family histories, and they're just, it's really interesting to hear so many wonderful voices that are all talking about how to bridge these differences, how to approach a sense of amity and friendship between these countries. So any, any thoughts or reflections you have to uh, you know, in closing? The question I have, the question is, can human beings, the human race, agree that humanity is one species? Are we one species? Are we different? So Stanford University needs to study that. So <laughs> are we going to agree that we are one species? If we agree to that, then we have to be warriors of peace. We have to put all our effort in not warring and destruction, but be warriors of peace. Because hate is extremely strong and people take advantage of that. Hating the other person, hating a different color, hating a different religion. So if, if we all made up our mind and said, yes, the human race is one species, then I think that's a beginning to see that we could be able to maybe get along with each other better. Even uh, Indian philosophy is kutum, kutum, one kutum, one family. The world is like, should be like a one family. But then, uh, is it said that done? Because there are so many interests which clash for various reasons. Political reasons, to grab power, greed, self ambitions. I mean, all these factors do not let us live like a human being. It's one humanity. I mean, if that, that dawns on each one of us, then things, things become uh, so easy. Then we can live. But unfortunately, it, it clashes with many other factors. And that is where even we are one species, one human beings, we can't live like that. So we have to uh, move with the time, move with the dictates of the leadership. And as they say, you can't clap in one hand. And you have to use both sides. Both sides have to come uh, and, and show magnanimous um, approach to solve all their uh, problems. This side of the border or that side of the border, that magnanimity attitude has to come. When that comes, things will become better. But when, uh, but if the, uh, if the hatred continues and out of that hatred, the actions are seen on the ground, then you never see the light of the day. You will never be like human beings. And in the partition we have seen that the humanity was at its worst. That's what the partition told us. Mr. Sean, would you like to say a few things uh, in closing about you know, how to approach friendship at this moment, 75th anniversary? How can we think about friendship across India? Well, there's the best uh, idea to approach as friendship. But the problem with this, you know, that it's very hard to, to people to agree on one point. They all have a different kind of point for everything. So, I mean, my opinion is that it's very hard to go on with one. Uh, this idea. It, it will go to be problem continuously. In, as you've seen, wars going around all over the place, even in here. They don't, even politicians let people agree on one point, and people themselves have a different points and fire starts. And it's happened going on, it will be going on. 
I, I, in my opinion, that it would be hard to agree with that. Well, one thing that gives me hope is just seeing everyone here who's showed up to this event and to our extraordinary Munita Bhalla who's done so much work to collect these stories and to let us see the parallels, the close extent to which they just mirror each other, that these are things that were done to each other that are so uh, similar. And I think just hearing your stories and your wonderful insistence on insistence on thinking about the joy and thinking about other possibilities uh, and opening up our accounts of suffering and trauma to encompass friendship and joyous memories from the past and possibilities and opportunities that we all had. I think these are all really very affirmative stories that please allow us here in the diaspora to imagine different ways of connecting across the borders. So I don't know, Bunita, you'd like to say something about the Partition Archive, which has been such a- Yeah, I want to invite Bunita up here. I know, you know, we don't have time. We have catering by Zareen. So after this closes, I want to invite you all to take some food and, you know, spend some time chatting with each other some more. I also do want to mention before, Bunita, if you want to head up here, just to give a few words. Uh, this is sponsored by the Center for South Asia, the Ibasi program, Islamic studies. So we want to thank them very much. And also some of the, the workers here, so Simrat, Kavya, and Kamal. Kavya and Kamal, both students here. So let's, let's give them in the back. <laughs> and I've been touched so much by these stories, and I think while Partition saw the worst of humanity, what a lot of these interviews have also shown is that there's also the best of humanity at the times where people were sacrificing their lives to take in people and to, to rescue people, really putting their lives at risk. And I think, um, Gunita, thank you so much for all the work that you've done. This, you know, wouldn't be possible had it not been for, you know, many years ago, Gunita deciding to leave for a career of, you know, astrophysics, is that right? <laughs> Condense, okay, yeah. So I'll let, I'll let you give a few words, and then after Gunita finishes, uh, we'll give everyone a hand and enjoy the food, please. Yeah, so thank you so much, everyone, for being here. And uh, also thank you, Baljeet uh, Anti and uh, Ravi Uncle and Ali Uncle for taking the time to come out and share your incredible uh, stories and educating all of us. Um, so I'll just give you guys a very quick spiel about what we do. Uh, so we are the 1947 Partition Archive, super grassroots. It all started here in the Bay Area uh, 12 years ago, actually. And it, it also started um, in part because my grandparents uh, passed away when I was quite young, but they passed away after telling me the story of partition and how they migrated. And to me, there was a huge discrepancy between what I was learning in my school history, which basically said that, you know, uh, Mahatma Gandhi led a peaceful movement, and the British left, and it was bloodless. But then my grandmother had told me that like millions of people died, and their jeep was going over dead bodies in order to survive. Uh, I mean, just the, you know, the dichotomy of that had bothered me sort of my whole life. And I really wanted to do something about it. And, um, you know, I was at the Hiroshima Peace Memorial, and their oral history archives are pretty incredible. Uh, and I realized by listening to the survivor accounts that you really have to hear it from the survivor. Like, if you hear it from them, it's all the different forms of communication that converge, just the body language, the tone, the words. And so when all of those forms of communication are telling the same story, it, I, I mean, we, we probably don't have enough science on it yet, but I'm sure we'll figure it out. It, it sort of hits you in a different way. Um, you empathize and you, know, you sort of absorb their uh, story and their experience in a different way. And so I realized like that's what we need to do. We need to talk to everybody who's gone through this so that this is not a lost chapter in history because I remember telling people about it. No, like my grandmother told me this happened. They're like, yeah, no, it's probably not a big deal. It's not in our books. So I was like, we need to change that, the fact that it's not in our books. So it's been a Herculean effort because, you know, it's a crowdsourcing oral histories was kind of a strange thing to do, but it definitely enabled by technology. Um, so the whole model was for this to be really citizen centric so, so that you have all kinds of voices because you know even the person interviewing has an intrinsic bias and so if you bring in hundreds thousands of people who are doing the interviews 
then you won't have one person's or two people's biases impacting uh, the project. And so it is a massive team effort. I know that you said my name a bunch of times, but I'm definitely not the only person. It's thousands of us. It's everybody who's experienced this. And so far, there's more than 10,500 individuals who've experienced partition who've been willing to take the time to share their experiences, even when it's really, really hard. And, um, and I think that's huge. And then, of course, there's all the volunteers who are documenting the oral histories. There are people who are archiving the oral histories. Then there are people who are just anonymous community volunteers who make this work possible by nominating somebody that they know um, to conduct the oral history interview. And you know, by, by doing it in a crowdsourcing format, the cool thing is that we've uh, gotten stories from the most unusual places. Like, you know, before this, when I started anyway, that was 13 years ago, we thought partition was limited to Punjab and Bengal. But the impacts of partition go all the way from Afghanistan to Burma, all the way from Kashmir down to the Andaman and Nicobar Islands. And, um, and also from these stories, we learn how different the Western and Eastern partitions were, because in the East, you seem to have a lot of violence and a lot of class division that's causing that violence. Uh, and you had, you know, uh, the World War, you had the Japanese fighting the Allied forces and the Japanese had bombed, you know, even Calcutta was bombed. Um, and and uh, they had taken over Burma and all of the American soldiers and other Allied soldiers who were in Bengal, in the East, uh, they ended up taking over the food supply causing this massive famine that I'm sure you've heard about, the Bengal famine of 1943. And all of that leads up to a lot of violence and a lot of bitterness, because the people who suffered the violence were of one class. The wealthy actually got wealthier because there was a lot of price gouging apparently happening, and that even leads up to riots in 1945 and 46. So you start to see a lot of that um, in Bengal, but in Punjab, a lot of, there's a lot more integration amongst classes and amongst uh, religious groups. And so you see this sudden explosion of violence that people are not expecting. Whereas in Bengal, people start to move a lot earlier, like in the early 40s, they're already expecting that something is going to blow up. So that's kind of, I'm just giving you a glimpse of some of the things that you can, you know, that we're learning from the oral histories. Because for me, it's always been a huge question mark. Like, how could this happen? You know, how could, um, my family who's lived in Lahore for hundreds of years have to leave. I'm sure that's you know the same for everybody here. Um, and also, I as a kid experienced 1984, which was a genocide that happened in Punjab, different story. But I think that kind of led me to want to do something about these kind of events so that we can move on to hopefully better management of violence, which seems as uh, Mr. Alishan said, is like a very intrinsic part of human nature. But how can we manage that? Um, in a way that, you know, we're not leading up to like a, a big third <laughs> nuclear war or something like that. Um, so I think, yeah, I just want to say that there's a lot of room, if you guys are interested in learning about partition, there's a lot of room to do it hands-on by participating as volunteers. There's all kinds of, you know, volunteer opportunities. Um, you can give somebody voice in your community by, you know, if you've got grandparents or parents um, or friends who experience partition, um, you can take an oral history workshop, it's free, and you can record um, their story so that it's not forgotten. So that's really all I want to say really quick.